Hello. Good afternoon. So my name is Carolyn Thayer. I'm currently a freelance designer, uh, designer based in Scarborough, Maine. Um, the majority of my current work is designing for WordPress, and I have some past experience in web app design and print design. Um, if you have any questions, please speak up during it. Feel free to raise your hand or shout out if I don't see you. And um, also, before we get started, I just want to take a quick survey of the room. How many of you are designers? Okay. How many of you um, are not designers but maybe are thinking of building a website? Great. Or how many of you are brick and mortar business owners? Okay, and how many of you have online-only businesses? Okay, great. So this presentation is really for anyone, and a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is um, before you even open a computer. So you can do everything I'm talking about with a pen and paper. Um, and it's really about what steps you should take before you design your website, before you build your website. Um, you probably won't need to use all of these tools. Each one for each website, you can use a combination, but it's great to have them in your toolbox to refer to. Um, people that are going to use probably all of these tools are people working either designing or working with e-commerce websites. People that will need to use less of these um, to none if you have a personal hobby and you're building a website for yourself. That's really probably the only case where a lot of these might not apply to you. So if you're writing about uh, skydiving, and you're writing to really just about your experiences skydiving, and you're writing because you just are passionate about it, and you're not trying to get any new users or change who's, you're just doing it for self-fulfillment, these might not all apply to you, but for everyone else, these will definitely apply to you. Um, what we're gonna talk about is user personas, sitemaps, user flows, and content guides. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll feel more confident defining your website and designing needs. And either if you're for the designers in the room, you'll be able to uh, help your clients lay out what they're looking for. And for people who own businesses, you'll be able to go to an agency and get a more accurate quote and have a better idea of what you need to be built before you go and talk to an agency. So the first thing we're going to talk about is user personas. Um, a persona is a written representation of your website's intended, intended users. And so what a user persona is, it's like a snapshot of a fictional person who represents research done on a major user group through your website. Um, this gives you a useful metric to design and critique your site with. Rather than having to remember the details of many people who've tested your site, you're looking at your site through the lens of three to five fictional characters. Um, this tool is really useful when you want to make sure a user accomplishes a certain goal, such as buy a product, call a number, find directions. So what makes a good user persona? Um, a good persona should focus on your intended audience. It is possible to have multiple audiences. However, if, you asked, if you're asked the question, who is your business targeting, and your answer is everyone, you're not actually targeting anyone. Um, really knowing your users and their needs is going to help you make effective design decisions. Um, as much as possible, your, use, your persona should be based on actual research or analytics. Without research, it is possible to make false assumptions about your users and therefore make faulty design decisions. A good user persona should be realistic. While it is okay to be aspirational, you want to keep your decisions based in reality. For example, if you're creating a persona for a nonprofit that typically receives many $25 to $100 donations, you don't want your persona to be a millionaire looking to give away all their worldly goods. You want to keep it on in reality. Um, not only is that scenario unlikely to happen, you could risk making design decisions that cause you to lose your current audience. lost that picture. <laughs> so sample user persona um, template. Let's see if I can get that. It's not going to let me go there. All right, so that got erased. But what a sample user persona document would look like, um, we can skip ahead. It's going to have, you can have a photo or not, a quick sketch of what your person would look like. That part isn't too point important, but it helps keep it in your memory and give a visual clue to you. Um, a name, an age, 
uh, information you can put on include their tech level, the desktop, um, the devices they're using, and a short summary and a quote they would say. So if I go back. Okay. So if we're uh, if I own a small grocery store and I'm adding an online delivery option to their website, this would be based on our research of someone who owns a brick and mortar store. This is who they said their two clients are. So we have Joyce Weber, who's 75. She's a novice tech level and she's a, uses a desktop computer. She's retired and lives by herself in an apartment downtown. She does not drive and struggles with lugging groceries home. Her goal is to get basic supplies easily and without relying on outside help quote she might say is not, it's not worth the hassle. And another user would be Laura Smith, age 39. She's an intermediate tech level. She uses an iPhone 6S. She lives in a residential neighborhood with three children between the ages of 7 and 12. She spends a lot of time driving them to and after school activities and sports. She prefers to shop local and will pay more for organic brands. Her goal is to save time without sacrificing quality. And something she might say is my time is important to me. So as a, using these personas when we're um, working on the site, we can use that to critique our design decisions by basing them against this metric. So in Joyce's case, we might say, okay, so for this site, we're gonna need a larger font that's easier to read. So we're gonna wanna bump the font size up so Joyce can read all of the information. Um, we're gonna want not too many pages to click through to order. She's probably gonna struggle if you have to do too many forms or too many clicks. And Joyce may even want to call in her order rather than fill out a complicated form. Um, so we want to make sure the phone number is easy to find. So if she has trouble, she can just call in her order. Um, for Laura, design decisions we might want to make. It needs to be mobile friendly. She's not going to be sitting on a desktop computer looking at the site. Um, we probably want a design that looks high quality versus discount. She mentioned um, quality and organic and local brands. So if the site looks too discount, too many big bubbly sales letters, that's she's not going to shop there. We're going to lose her key audience. Um, she also might want to click the call button, which is more mobile friendly, uh, and a primary position on the site versus a form because she's on her phone. So then we can go to look at our comps, and we can go back to these users and decide what we need and critique those design decisions based on these users. Another tool to look at before design is your sitemap. Sitemaps are a hierarchical diagram showing the structure of a website or application. Uh, they're a way to organize the information and navigation of your website. So after creating a sitemap, you should have a complete map of all the pages and the subpages in your site. So how do you make a sitemap? Um, a lot of people start with something easy to move around and is editable. So um, a great way is post-it notes. And you can start your sitemap by writing down the names of all the pages you'll need on post-it notes and stacking them in rows under the home page and how you feel they should be organized. Then you can go in and redundant information can be consolidated. You can scribble on the post-it notes. You can throw out any that you feel you don't need. And then when you're done, your first row will end up becoming your main navigation. And it generally should not be more than to seven to eight post-it notes or seven to eight pages. So for a landscape business that's doing maybe post-it notes and a whiteboard, um, they may have a home page. Underneath that, they'll have about us, our services, gallery, contact us. And under our services, they'll have the sub pages mowing and snow removal. From the sitemap, we can tell that we need to design seven pages total. Uh, the main nav will have four options, and our services will drop down to two pages. So one thing that's easy to confuse a sitemap with is a sitemap versus a user flow. They kind of both have similar formats. Um, user flows, and also another word for them is task flows, are often confused with sitemaps as they can both take the form of flowcharts. The difference in, is in what they present, uh, represent. A sitemap is about your pages and your navigation. And a user flow is how a user gets from point A to point B. Um, an example from uxmovement.com is that a sitemap is like looking at a map of a territory from a bird's eye view with all major landmarks visible on the map. 
and a user flow is like putting in coordinates in Google Map and getting directions from your starting point to your end point, and you can see which route to take, where to turn, and how many miles it gets there. Um, so to look at some examples of user flows, user flows are also, they're really useful for large apps and larger e-commerce sites. If you have a smaller blog or a smaller informational site, it might not be as important to your site. Um, so also known as a blueprint, journey, narrative, or map, a user flow is a deliverable that demonstrates the step-by-step -step elements required to allow the user and the business to accomplish their objectives. Um, when do you need a user flow? So user flows are really useful in sites that require its users to complete a task to be successful. So if you have a site that you need someone to convert, that you need someone to put something in a cart, accomplish a goal you want, you can then look at a user flow. Um, examples can be creating an account on, uh, slash onboarding, adding an event to a calendar, putting a product in a cart and checking out, filling out a form to download an ebook. Um, your user flow should help you to see how long and straightforward the process is to completing the task you want your users to take. If the task is too long, complicated, or confusing, you can lose users on the journey and not fulfill the goal of your site. Um, one exercise in thinking about user flows is to compare different ways to buy laundry detergent. So if you compare the user journey in creating an online account to purchasing a detergent online um, versus running to a grocery store or versus using a tool such as the Amazon Dash button where you press it and you've already signed up for an account and it just shows up at your door, um, those are all very different experiences. And looking back at those user personas we talked about, different personas are going to prefer the different experience. Um, someone may just rather than fill out a four-page online form, they're going to run to the store, whereas someone else um, really wants that dash button even if it takes the time to create the account before. So that's a good way, looking at those user flows, comparing to your um, sample users is a great way to critique your site. So this is a sample user flow for a checkout process. And this would be a relatively simple checkout process. But as you can see, when you draw out all the steps, even a simple checkout process, there are more steps than you'd guess at first. Um, looking at this user flow, we can tell that the longest path to checkout is creating a new user account before checking out. That's going to be the most amount of steps. Um, this is why having a guest checkout option for users in a hurry is great. And you can look at this and either go to your client and say, hey, you really need a guest checkout. Look how many steps it takes to create an account to check out for your product. Um, or as a business owner, you can say, yeah, we really need to make this quick and easy so our customers can get there. Um, other options to consider looking at this form or this user flow would be having a social sign-in as an option, um, having your default shipping address be the same as your billing address, having a one-page checkout with billing info, billing address, shipping address, and shipping info all on the same page. Um, a user flow is going to show you barriers to users completing the goals on your site. So after you create your user flow, you want to go back to your user persona and see if they would be able to or want to complete that goal. Okay. Uh, another important site before you, or item before you design is content guide documents. These are, everyone needs these. <laughs> I don't think you should build a site without a content guide document. Um, if you are a business working with an agency, a lot of times they'll have their own that you, they want you to fill out. I recommend no matter what you're doing, do one on your own before you talk to anyone and then have the agency refine it or fill out theirs as well. But um, definitely get an idea of what content you're putting on your site because that is the biggest hurdle to getting your site designed a lot of times and the most time consuming part is getting the content. Um, so if you're working with an agency, they'll often provide you with the preferred format. And it can be simple as a multi-page Word document. Each page should correspond to an item on your site map, um, going back to that site map we talked about before. And a simple content document will contain your headlines and your text. A more complex content guide can contain the names of photos to include, SEO information, calls to action, and more. So why use a content guide? As I said before, it helps speed up the whole process. Um, whether you're working with a client or whether you're doing it yourself, 
designing to the content is going to produce a much better user experience than guessing what the content is and having to cram it into a design. <coughs> content guide benefits. Uh, your designer will have an idea of the size of your content and can design for it rather than trying to smush your content into a template. You'll have an idea of all the images and assets that you need to gather to provide to your designer. Um, and it will speed up the whole process. As you can't launch a website without the content. You can launch a website with a lot of things, but a website with lorem ipsum is just going to look really bad. This is a really basic sample content guide. Uh, just a Word document with a page title. Let's say, so this would be for an About Us page. The content, um, Acme Inc. has been serving our customers' needs for over 10 years. We source all of our products locally right here in Maine. We are a family-owned business that strives to meet your needs uh, with a subsection of who we are, the names of the people. A call to action at the bottom that will say, need Acme services, contact us for a quote today. And the images on the page that someone will need to gather would be a team photo, uh, a headshot for Tom, Jane, and Mark. And this is a really bare bones an example, but it can give you an idea of where to start. Um, and it just helps put your design at the forefront. So what if I am working with an agency? So if you own your own business um, or and you're planning on working with an agency, there's huge benefits to starting to like work on your site before talking to an agency. Um, you can get a more accurate quote and time estimate. You can go to them and you say, okay, I know my site is gonna be seven to 10 pages. It's gonna have all this content. It's gonna be really image heavy or it's gonna have no images and four pages. Um, you as a business owner or as someone of your own site, you have firsthand knowledge of your users and your audience. So you're able, rather than someone guessing who looks at skydiving sites from an agency, you know who looks at it and you know what they're reading and you're able to provide that to them. Hey, yeah. You said yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I just wanted to say from the agency perspective, if there's people here who are yeah. one company, I would charge so much less if somebody <laughs> came in and said, this is what I need and here's the content. Yeah. So if you're organized like that, you're going to... Yeah, it's, it's, it really makes it so much faster. Um, and gets the site built quickly. Also, I feel like you're able then to use the agency to their fullest potential to make recommendations. So they can look at your content and say, great, here's a starting point. Now we're gonna add in keywords. We're gonna optimize for SEO. Um, you know, this about section, you have five pages that are all kind of similar. We're gonna combine this into one page. And the agency can focus on refining and improving your performance of your website rather than trying to figure out what your business does and what they sell. Um, and I talked really fast, so <laughs> I have resources uh, here from a bunch of everything I quoted and uh, also this template. This is the template that didn't get loaded. And I have put all the slides on Twitter. Um, but that's the last one is a template that didn't get loaded. But here's a bunch of articles about what I talked about. Um, no, but is that, that going to be on the website, the WordCamp? Uh, no, I, I uh, tweeted a, a link to my. It's uploaded to my own personal website. All the slides. So. Um, yep. Yeah, let me put that up. So if you yeah. go right here, there's a link. So it's at Carolyn Thayer. And there, I just tweet out a link and I can retweet it a little later. So, and you said the slides are also on your website? Yep, or the link will take you right to my website. And I'll... Yes? Yeah, this is uh, very, very informative. I, I just put together. Um, you had one page up for the content document. Yes. And was that specifically for a page or was that for the document in general? Are what you talking about this one or there was one? Yes. Okay, yes. So that is. That is an example of what uh, a sample, like a fake content document, would look like for one page. So this would be for an About Us page. So you've already developed your page layout, or, I mean your pages already? Nope, so this would be before you even go to the computer and you're just sitting down, whether you're sitting down with a client or if you're a business owner and you're trying to think out, you'd probably, you'd have already done your site map. That's so. it, okay, so you've done your site map. So, so you've you done, content for each exactly. Each so you've done this part and you have this, either in a notebook, on a whiteboard, and now you're going to sit down and you're going to write out for each one of these post-it notes, you're going to do one of these 
documents. So how do you develop, if I may just say, the, so the site map freely is working? It is, yeah. So I think you'd have to go and just think of, if you have, uh, if you're working with a client who has a site already, you have a lot more information. You can look at their analytics, you can look at what people are buying, you can look at where people are clicking, and you can refine from there. If you're starting a brand new site from scratch, you really have to talk with the business owner, or if you're the business owner, you yourself have to think about your business and really plan out what you want to say. And this is also where working with an agency can help because you figure out as a business owner who your audience is, what they want, what you want to sell, what you want to say, and then an agency can come in and say, so you think about your services and you've written them all down and you make an our services package. And an agency might come in and say, okay, for SEO purposes, we want to break out each service into its own page. So we're going to, that's great that you wrote down your our services page and you say we do mowing and snow removal. You wrote a whole page about that. An agency can come in and say, great, now we know you do those two services. We're going to separate that into two pages. One page for mowing, one page for snow removal. And we're going to make uh, a content guide for each one and refine that. And that way you'll be fine how you're in Google. Uh, yep. Can you speak about uh, doing the analytics for personas? And what, ooh, yes. So, as a designer, I work with great people who do that for me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's hard to say. Uh, work with a, a great developer with analytics skills. <laughs> um, I would say definitely base your personas on analytics if you can. If you're having a brand new business from scratch, that's a little hard. If you own a brick and mortar store, ask your customers that come in. I think that's a big thing. Um, look at who, look at your Google Analytics if you have an online store. If you have a brick and mortar store, look who's coming into your store. And I, I am, I'm an even big advocate. Of Put a few surveys by your register. Ask people regulars that you see. It doesn't have to be a complicated analytic certificate. It can just be people who are regularly you're regularly seeing if you have that brick and mortar option. And ask them face to face if they have, you know, give them a five dollar. One place I worked was rebranding their site and it was a coffee shop and they just gave out five dollar gift cards to anyone who would talk to them about why they like the store versus other stores, why they went there, what motivated them to go there. And then from that, I think they did that for 25 people. They got an idea of their audience, what type of people shop there, different age ranges, and who comes there for what reasons. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm currently volunteering for a nonprofit, and I feel like the it's my first time ever designing a, a website for anyone. Mm -hmm. So the biggest obstacle came across the content guide because the client, the owner of the nonprofit, isn't really sure on what the content is wants to be on the website. So yeah. Through a huge cog. So I was wondering if you, there was any like any templates or like app software applications that mm -hmm. have lists of things that a website could possibly need as far as content. So maybe that could inspire them to find them. I haven't seen any. A lot of times, what we do is we, um, what I'll do is look at competitors or like businesses and do an analysis of say, like here's your three biggest competitors or here's three other businesses like you in a similar vein, here's what they're doing. Um, the hard part about that is you have to hope those competitors do their research and have good sites. <laughs> <laughs> so you're kind of relying on that, but it is a good way to see what other people are doing and get an idea and jog their, um, I usually do a what's two sites you love and what's two sites you hate and why, and then have them go into, the, if they are um, having a hard time vocalizing what they want. I feel that's a great way to prompt them to look and think about what they want and what they don't want. Yeah, I, I usually say, you know, what's two sites in this field, you know, that you want to look like or feel like, and what do you like, what do you like? That's key. You can't just say, what do you like? You have to say, what do you like about them? And get more information. And then what are two sites that you hate? And why do you hate them? And that way you know if they hate uh, rotating testimonials. Well, not that other site versus they just hate this other competitor site and you don't know why and it turns out there's a very specific thing that they're looking for. I'm curious, maybe this is because I'm older, mm -hmm. where do you put the contact info, like on that one, do you put it on your home page or do you put it in the About Us or did you bury it? I just find so many people bury it and it's very annoying to me because if I don't find mm -hmm. Zincor, I try to call and then to try to find yep. a phone number on a website. I put it 
depending on what you want them to do. So if, it really depends on what the site is about. If, if their goal, if they have to fill out a form to get a quote, an insurance agency or something, I may put that on a separate page because you need them to fill out the form. Um, if you really, like if a phone call is all it takes to get that information to make that conversion, um, then I'll put that, you know, we'll, I'll put contact us or the phone number right up in the header as soon as they can find it and make it click to call so people on mobile can get to that. Um, but it really, yeah, like a couple different examples. A restaurant, I put a phone number, I put it in the header versus uh, if you're trying to get them to download a ebook and you need their email or a newsletter sign up, you're going to put an email contact form very prominent. So it's depending on what the business is as to what you put in where. But yeah, anything that you need them to do on the site, your primary goal should be close to the top. Yep. So now that you have this information about who your demographic is and the content, where do you start designing? Do you start with a drawing on paper? Do you mm -hmm. start by looking at inspiration of other sites? Do you automatically go straight to like um, a service like Webflow mm -hmm. to figure out your, to make a design prototype? I usually start with uh, depending on the scale of the project, I'll start with research, look at other sites. Um, if it's something I've done a lot of and kind of know what's out there for, you know, say construction sites, I may have built a few of those, then I may not spend so much time on research. But if it's a huge, if it's an industry that I'm not familiar with, I'll start with research. Um, then I go to wireframing. That's usually my next step. What do you what? do wireframing with? Um, I do it either, I, well, I do a basic sketch in pen and paper, and then I can move, if it's something I'm showing to the client as a deliverable, I, there's different software, like I think mockups is one I've used, um, and if it's a very large project, you can go from mockups to um, prototypes, and, uh, or well, mockups to um, comps and Illustrator, Photoshop, Sketch, prototype, and then development. Um, if it's a smaller site that you know it's going to be on a template, I might move right from wireframes to um, right to development, or right from I might even skip wireframes if it's going to be a template, really fast template site, and you know it's going to be half half columns, three pages. I might even skip the wireframe step because you know you have your content guide that says what's going to be on there, and it's going to be four pages. And, um, but yeah, it, it really depends on the scale and how complex. Like an e-commerce site is going to require a lot more than a basic um, like church website. Any other questions? Yep. Is there anywhere you specifically go for um, like creative inspiration or to look at trends for web or to look at anything going on in the industry? Yeah, I look at a lot of different pages. So I have, let's see if I can find it. have this plugin on my Chrome browser. Um, what is it called? Okay. Uh, it's by Envision. Envision bought it. It was not originally through Envision, but it's an ins it keeps track of a bunch of design blogs, and you can click which design and development blogs you want to focus on, and anytime you open a new tab in Chrome, it gives you articles and infinite scroll. What's it called? What's it called? called Muse, M U L Z I, and it's owned by InVision. And a Chrome extension. Yeah. Yep. It's a Chrome extension, and so that's a good one for a passive inspiration. So I don't have to go searching for it a lot. It's just all right there. Um, <laughs> I also look Pinterest a lot. I have lots of Pinterest boards, and if I see something I like, I just pin it. And then when I'm feeling stuck, I just go back and I pin it by category. So I'll go back to web design or branding or print or even more specific typography. I have like one board just for web typography. <laughs> also, if you see any sites you like, I usually try to look at what I like about them and maybe also put that onto Pinterest if it's not, or save it somewhere, or save a screenshot. And that's how I end up with lots of, I cleaned my desktop before this presentation, because I think there's about 9 million things all over my desktop. <laughs> yep.
beginning, you had two different users for a mm -hmm. website. So at the end of the day, how do you, you try to please both people? Um, yeah, so I think um, I would probably, you know, you want to keep, it's really what I said before about if you're targeting everyone, you're not targeting anyone, but you can have multiple audiences. Um, it's a lot easier if you have an existing store or website to see trends in your audience. So if you look at your analytics, you can see if there's trends between people, or if you have a brick and mortar store, what type of customer you have coming in. Um, and I mean, the goal would be to group them between one and three people. You don't, once you start getting into too many people, you're gonna have to make sacrifices and you're gonna lose that targeting. Um, but yeah, really doing a survey of a bunch of people, and that's what makes the user personas easier is because they're fictional. So that, those two personas could be based on a survey of 50 people, and then you can break it down to the two prime prominent groups. Yep. All right, time is. Any more questions? are going to have overlapping and that's going to make your design decisions absolutely easy when you're and I think you can refer back to those over and over again at each stage both the wireframe stage to your design comps to your um, prototypes um, sometimes you may have conflicting and have to make a decision that personal taste. I don't have any like it's bad or it's good or don't do that. I don't know any rules, but I personally like .com, but I don't think it's or .org if you're a nonprofit. Um, that's what I usually go with. I think the rarer the end is, mm -hmm. the harder it's going to people are going to type it wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it probably will still work as a single short code being dropped into a page. I mean, most of the things that might have trouble with Gutenberg would be advanced nested short codes. They're rewriting the script that parses short codes, and edge cases that get ex uh, exploited by some page builders that are based in short codes, where they inject page, short code after short code after short code after short code, those are not necessarily going to be trustworthy because they're exploiting edge case uses. So that would be like the column builders? That would be like a column builder that uses nothing but short codes. Those could have trouble. Now, there's no guarantee that they'll have trouble. Um, they could actually be addressed better by Gutenberg, but it's just there's no promise that Gutenberg is going to support the kind of edge case that was never officially supported by WordPress to begin with. So the if it drops in by a short code, you're probably fine. If it drops in by 50 short codes, that's a little more iffy. <laughs> And if you had one plugin for columns and you're using, say, Max Buttons, which uses other short codes, then you short switch. codes are a questionable thing. Okay. I know you didn't want to, but would you plug Blockade for I, us? I can plug it briefly for you. Basically, um, the biggest thing I hate about short codes is that they take you out of the WordPress editing experience. Uh, short codes, um, page builders. They have their own experience. They take you away from custom meta fields. They don't base themselves in what wonderful environment WordPress has already given us. So Blockade is basically a page builder built inside TinyMCE um, in the actual editor itself. So it gives you columns, it gives you buttons, it gives you, and it gives you visual displays for all of the blocks, um, drag and drop, etc. But the goal is just 
stay in what WordPress gave you and just enhance it. Um, whereas everybody else seems to want to replace, and I know why they do it, because seriously, this has been a nightmare building. Um, but uh, yeah, so the big, the big plus there is uh, that, and that everyone has your HTML. You can actually inspect anything in Blockade, and if you need something super custom for your needs, you can just edit attributes, you can change what column spacings you're using with that or with the interface, and it's based in Bootstrap, so it's super common. Uh, just not plug in it because, you know, it's not popular, and it probably will change with Gutenberg. I plan to keep it going, but it's going to oh, need to so. match content blocks, which are a very different answer. Yeah. For those of us in the back, could you read off your email address up there? or the Oh, the, the web address? Link? So, yeah, the, yeah this is going to be hiding at uh, gshoppy.com, G-S-C-H-O-P-P-E.com, slash WC Boss 2017, WordCamp Boss 2017. Um, so WC BOS 2017. Uh, and I'll have the more complete version there probably after lunch. Uh, we got time for one or two more. Okay, two more. I got you back there. Are most of these uh, page builder layouts, um, are they based on Flexbox? And if so, um, are there implications for Internet Explorer? So um, a lot of them are based on Flexbox. The question is, uh, are a lot of the page layouts based on Flexbox and other implications for Internet Explorer? Um, a lot of them are based on Flexbox, especially if they give you vertical controls. Not every one of these does give you vertical controls inside columns, but if they do, they're normally based on some variant of the Bootstrap 4 grid, not necessarily exactly Bootstrap 4's grid, um, and that means that your Internet Explorer compatibility is not going to be complete back to IE 10. It's going to be 11 and up. Um, it falls back fairly gracefully, and you know the IE 10 users are not going to get your vertical centering. They might not get uh, content flipping for which column goes first, things like that. But your standard uses are going to stick. And um, honestly, at this point, I think anyone using IE 10 or below, it's, it's, it's OK to give them a slightly degraded experience. <laughs> we got time for one more. Oh, that one's perfect. So I don't really know if this is a page builder question. So basically, I'm looking to build a site that has a, um, a portfolio for a photographer. And do I want to look at a page builder? Do they have includes things like widgets, or do I want to go looking for a plugin? Do I want to look for a widget? Or do I want to learn how to write my own widgets? Well, I mean, I'm a dev, so I almost always say, oh, yeah, you should write your own. Um, that normally is not a great excuse uh, or not a great answer for people because that's a very long and arduous process uh, for one thing. I will say it's a great reason to do it. But um, <laughs> in terms of generally getting a portfolio off the ground, um, you want a custom post type with custom templates. So, so a plugin like custom post type UI could help you with that if you wanted to go the more custom template build it yourself route. If you wanted to go the more drop in solution, there's portfolio plugins for pretty much all of these page builders out there where you'd install the page builder itself and then a portfolio plugin would add the custom post type, the grid controls for dropping in blocks. So either option. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Which does it? It's lunchtime. There probably will be more questions about page builders. It's an endless task. If any of you want to catch me at all, I'm going to be kicking around. I'll be eating lunch at some point. But uh, I'll uh, have a happiness bar at one point. But, uh, or you can always hit me up on Twitter, email. Um, or my website. Lunch downstairs, everyone. Uh, yes. So the biggest thing, I mean, I come from C and Java mostly, and the biggest thing that was starting off the page was I almost forgot. Uh,